Welcome to another episode of Big Ego Media. Got a special guest, goes by the name of Mr. Kofi Coranten. How are you doing today, sir? Hey, Bobby. Um, I couldn't be anywhere else in the world, uh, but here at Big Ego, I am thankful to you, uh, to Fletcher, my buddy, uh, for you making the time to be here. I know you had to be with your daughter, you have, you had, had to be with your family, uh, but you made time for us to be here today. I'm excited. I'm out of my mind. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. So my, my audience, unless I guess they're Ghanaian, wouldn't have an idea who you are. So we need to get to the gist of it. How we always start with our interview is getting to know someone from the very get-go. So let us know where you're from and where did you grow up? All right. So, uh, Bobby, I, I was born in Ghana. Um, I went to school in Ghana. Uh, for those who are Ghanaian, your audience who are Ghanaian, I went to school at Agri Memorial uh, International School next to the broadcasting at uh, Ringway. I uh, went to Cape Coast Uni uh, University Primary, Cape Coast University. Went to Garrison Primary, uh, Kumase, and went to Adisado College at Disco in Cape Coast uh, before I came to London. I uh, went to school, Woodbury Downs, uh, North London. Oh, in Hackney, yeah, Stanford Hill. Stanford, you see, he knows, yeah, yeah, he knows. Yeah, 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 yeah. Woodbury Downs. Manor Man Man Park, Manor Man House. Manor Man Man House, Manor Man House, between Manor yeah, House and Stanford yeah. Hill. Yeah, I know that. And place, then yeah. uh, went to uh, Southgate College in Enfield. Uh, you know, in the Piccadilly, go heading to Cock Foster's. Uh, then went to New York. I lived most of my life in New York uh, before I relocated to Ghana. I mean, in 2019. You you are someone um, you just spoken there a, a lot of education. So you've, you you you're someone that's um, a, a real learned. But what what I want to sort of ask is that is that something that was because of your parents? Because back home people kind of struggle to get an education and get to get a foot up. How was your sort of background? Did you live in a two-parent household? Because a lot of times in the UK, we've got people growing up in sort of single-parent households. And what's the difference between the growing up in Ghana and here? Well, the, to tell the truth, that was a single parent for the most part. Um, I, I grew up uh, for the most part at the beginning of my life with my dad and uh, the uh, middle part of my life with my mother. When I came to London, I was with my mother. When I was in Ghana, I was with my dad. Uh, a strict family. Uh, my my moms and pops were separated, uh, so we lived on both sides of the aisle, you know. Um, but they were very strict, uh, and education was a big part of uh, growing up. So we there, there was no other way. I mean, if you wanted to make it in life, you had to get your education. So. Uh, you know, getting education was part of what was expected. So I didn't think anything of it except for going to school and getting your education and kind of grade. Um, and that's what we did, uh, me and my, my, myself and my three sisters. So... Um, You're the oldest? Actually, the youngest. The youngest, okay. Yeah. So um, going to school was just part of what was expected and we, I just went through it. Okay, so uh, what brought you um, to lead yourself to head to the U.S. from the U.K.? That's correct. Um, I went to the U.S., uh, went to school at NYU. Uh, my background is in finance, and uh, when I was in, uh, I went to Southgate, it was engineering. So I mixed their engineering and finance. Um, I, I've been an advocate also fighting for the rights of our people, uh, uh, Ghanaians, uh, for the most part, um, in the U.S., and, uh, you know, working to just see that our people were represented well in social circles. Uh, that's what I have done, for the most part. Went to Ghana, just didn't like the way things were going, um, have had uh, many uh, occasions where we suggested better ways for the government of Ghana to do things to get the result to be able to help Ghanaians. Um, but the government had other plans, so uh, they would always take bits and pieces from suggestions and prescriptions that we would give them. Uh, and of course, uh, they will always fail. 
So we've gone to a point now where we are sick and tired of seeing the government fail on something that uh, really is a very simple thing to fix in Ghana and Africa as a whole. Uh, the problem is leadership, and today I'm sure we're going to talk a little bit about it, uh, about leadership and why it, it seems to uh, uh, really elude uh, our leaders in Africa, uh, especially in Ghana. I mean, let's, let's talk about Africa and uh, the leadership, as you just mentioned there. Our African leaders, um, as I've seen, been seen lately, I don't know if you follow a organization called African Stream, and they do a lot of... Um, on Instagram, they do a lot of um, content around Africa, and I see it get my lot of my news over there. What I'm starting to see more is African leaders actually starting to speak up against the West and talk about taking ownership of resources, taking ownership of the financial um, institution. Is that something that you're seeing happening across the board in Africa? And something that's alerted you as well? Well, it, it, speaking is good. Uh, I'm not about the speaking. I'm from a culture and an ethic that's about doing and not okay. speaking. So it's good to speak, but I want to see more of the action. And the action should not be coming from the deadbeat leaders that we have, uh, but should come from the youth side. We want the youth to be more proactive uh, and, and take the bull by the horns and start really taking responsibility and ownership in the process of leading a new world in, in Africa. Uh, these leaders, yes, they talk in a good game, but till we actually see uh, results actually permeate in the lives of the African child, uh, the African citizen, um, it's not good enough to just talk against the West. You don't get anything done talking against the West. You get everything done when you do for your people. Mm. And that's what I am about, doing for our people. One thing I was going to ask about as well, again, regards to leadership, is there a, a, a fear for a lot of them? Because you've seen what's happened in the past with the likes of Lumumba, Gaddafi, and what they've done, I guess, even with Zimbabwe, when Mugabe wasn't someone they wanted to work with anymore, um, caused mass inflation in their country. Is that, you think, is a fear that some um, presidents and leaders have because they don't want to sort of be the next one? Does that make sense? Well, you know, it, it's, it's an illusion. Uh, and the reason why I say it's an illusion is right now, maybe before 20, 30 years ago, it could have been seen as a fear. But right now, Bobby, uh, the truth of the ma matter is we are in a new world order. You know, we have uh, uh, BRICS, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa forming strong, uh, thinking about really propelling their own uh, currency in, in gold and oil uh, and moving away from the dollar. And uh, you got uh, countries like uh, Saudi Arabian, uh, you know, uh, the Arab nations, Iran, uh, actually wanting, filing to join with the BRICS. Uh, we have uh, Argentina, uh, all these big nations are filing and so many other nations filing to work with the BRICS. Uh, the Africans are not at the table, mm. you see. So uh, this is the first time that African nations can emerge from the shadows uh, because uh, the West is busy trying to figure out how they can stay stable. They, their systems they have built, um, they are finding out that may not be sustainable for long and they have to start re-engineering their own models and they're not, uh, I don't think they care about what Africa does, uh, you know, because they need to stay relevant in their own societies and circles. And this would be the best time. So to use as an excuse that, oh, listen, if we were to pop our heads up and do for our nations, what is common sense? And that's all we're asking. Uh, the West they would not worry about you if you gave your people water 24 hours a day. The West is not going to wo worry about you if you gave them electricity 24 hours a day. The West is not going to worry about you if you don't steal money from your people 24 hours a day. The West is don't care about you if you fix your roads and broken infrastructure so your people could live comfortably and they could have education and health care uh, and they could have uh, working communities that thrive and people 
uh, uh, people's aspirations uh, come to pass. The, the, the West would not worry about those things. So what about those things, Bobby? Uh, what happened? So what we're saying is if, if you focus on the common sense things, and that's all the people are worried and focus on, nobody's going to come get you. Don't use it as an excuse. Focus on the common sense things for your people. That's not too much to ask. Sure. So this narrative about, oh, well, the West killed Lumumba and Kwame Nkrumah, so we have to, you know what, take a step back, give our people water, it's nonsense. No, I hear you. And in regards to the influence of China in Africa, especially in Ghana as well, uh, what are kind of your views on that? Is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? It, well, it, it's not a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Uh, uh, the relevance of China's emergence in Africa its, rel its relevance will be based on how prepared our leaders are. If our leaders are ready, then guess what? And they know how to negotiate and prepare the ground, then we will benefit because China is just concerned with one thing. They're ready to do business. China wants to play ball. If you can't play ball, then I guess they're just going to use your court and you're not going to be part of the ball playing but they will be playing ball in Africa, whether you like it or not, because they're already there. So the, 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 what we're asking the leaders to do is to train our youth to be globally competitive so when China comes to play ball or as they are there now playing ball, we'll be able to play head-to-head -head with them. But is that the case, Bobby? That's not the case. Is that the case? That's not the case. We're not ready for China. So they're going to, to, to steamroll us, and by the time they are done, we're going to have nothing. Because whether we like it or not, they are coming. Matter of fact, scratch that. They are there already, you see? So we are actually behind schedule. We need to start actually uh, uh, putting uh, our youth on the fast track and get them ready so that we could play ball with China because they are there, and the whole world is in Africa. Well, so what I was going to ask then, so what makes you qualified to be that person, that leader, to take the helm and change the narrative of Ghana and wide, widely Africa? Well, because I'm the only one who talks the way I do. I'm the only one who understands the dynamics of the new world order. Uh, did you ever hear any Ghanaian... Uh, leader talking like the way I am talking? No. They talk about how to win local elections, how to pay people so that they could get local elections won. That, does that sound like they know China is coming? It doesn't seem like that to me, Bobby. You see? So I just came off on a trip, you know, uh, went to Qatar, went to uh, uh, Singapore, went to uh, 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 Shang, uh, Shanghai, uh, went to uh, Pudong, I went to a couple of places in China. And the model that they are, you know, I've always talked about science-based, data-driven, human-centered. They understand human-centeredness in building. Do we? No. Um, so my model before I even went to China and the East I understood human-centeredness. The models we've been used to that we have built up until now has not focused on our human-centeredness. It's been capitalist-based models. Capitalist-based models are not sustainable. The world will find out pretty soon why it's not sustainable. So you um, once also ran, I think in the last election, um can you talk us through that and why it didn't um, work, work out for you? Well, we, we run in 2020. Uh, we got disqualified because the political parties of NDC and MPP, who are the ruling uh, party and the opposition party, felt threatened. Uh, and they had to do what they had to do to get us off the ballot. Uh, and what they, was that? What exactly did they do to get you off the ballot? Uh, well, they, they came with a charge that I forged signatures, but... Uh, Bobby, if you forge signatures, that makes you a criminal. Yeah. But uh, it, they gave me my filing fees back, uh, 100,000 CDs of filing fees. They called me and gave it back to me and said, 
we disqualified you for uh, this violation. It's a criminal violation. We reported you to the criminal investigation department, but we're still going to give you your money back. Uh, I don't know how to explain that, except I leave that to the viewers to make that out. But they just did not want me on the ballot. And what's happened since with that case? Is it just gone? Uh, we did, we, there, there was no case. I went to the police department wanting to find out the basis for my charge. There was no charge. There was no filing. It was all made up. So and how are you going to combat that, combat that this time? Because they could do the same thing again. Well, this time what we're going to do is we're going to give all our paperwork to an attorney, a law firm, who is going to call the people who are on our forms and verify with them and get affidavits signed before we present it to the Electoral Commission. So they cannot say that the same people who are on our list have called them to say that they were not responsible for putting their signatures on our forms. And realistically, what do you believe your chances are of actually winning the vote? Oh, uh, listen, if you listen to... I uh, Before I went on a tour, I was doing Facebook Lives every week, TikToks every week, engaging with the youth. They are, they are ready, they are upset, they are pissed off, they want to change, they want, they want to be part of this new world order. They want to have jobs, they want to have lifestyle, they want to live their lives, as everybody should in the new world. Uh, so uh, they are ready to support our candidacy. We're excited that they have finally taken ownership. Uh, we want to work with them and get the numbers. You know, we honestly think this is going to be a blowout. Uh, push back to what we've been used to. And this blowout, uh, as we saw in the last um, election, by election happening in Ghana uh, last week, I believe last week, a week and a half ago, uh, uh, we used to political parties paying people to vote. This time they took their money but never voted for them. So we're going to see that on a larger scale come 2024. And how do you kind of I guess go against that. If a political party got that money to pay people to go and vote for them, how do you combat that? How do you kind of compete with that level? Well, we're not going to compete because they're going to uh, uh, self-destruct. Uh, what I, Maybe perhaps you didn't understand what I said, but what happened is they took the money from the political parties but never voted oh, for them. Okay. And that was so, the last by-election recently. Yeah, just recently, in the last uh, week and a half, two weeks ago. So... Uh, what is going to happen is, regardless of how much they pay people, people knowing that their criminal organizations will not vote for them. They're going to vote for the one they trust, and it's going to be us. Okay. And I've had a few questions come through from a few of my Ghanaian friends. They said, um, at the moment, Ghana has a debt of 600 billion cities. Um, how are you going to try to pay that off or get that recovered? Very simple. We don't have any industries, Bobby. So if you don't have any industries, you don't have any income. The only income you have is by borrowing money. That's why the governments of NDC and NPP have gone to the IMF 17 times. Does that sound like somebody who has a plan, Bobby? If you go to the IMF to ask for money, whether pan and beg for money 17 times, when the same mistakes that took you there has happened 17 times. It, it's, does it sound like these guys have a plan? But they did. They went 17 times. What we need to do is to start bringing and making income. And the way we're going to make income is investing in agriculture. So we're going to invest in agriculture. And where once the output from agriculture, we're going to put it into industries. We're going to add value to everything. Bobby, would you believe that we have 80% of our exports are in gold, oil, and cocoa? Can you believe that we don't add $1 value to any of these three products and it represents 80% of our exports? So we don't add value. I just came off. In Singapore, I went to a gold store. One kilo of gold is $77,000 and change. Can you imagine selling that to uh, foreign companies without adding value? Though, uh, the, you know, I don't, I don't know if you watch the Gold Mafia uh, 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 documentary uh, last couple of months on gold that they take from Africa. But there was a gentleman called Matthias who takes 
40 million dollars of gold out of Ghana every month. 40 million. Now, 40 million is half a billion every year. So half a billion, and he's been at this thing for 13 years, according to him. 13 years. So if he's taken half a billion from Ghana, and you multiply that even just by 10, that's 5 billion. If this international standard for value add for gold is about 23 times. If we did 20 on 5 billion, that would be $100 billion just from one person. One person. One person. So does it make sense if you can make from one product $100 billion? Why would you want to go to IMF for $3 billion, Bobby? Make sense to you? Mm. These guys have totally lost it. They don't know. They, they don't have they, the mental capacity to add value to all the things that as we have in natural resources in Ghana. And that's why they're not fit to lead, because you cannot lead by borrowing. No country has ever uh, grown into a first world country borrowing money and not having surpluses. Right now, we don't have any foreign exchange reserves. And the only way we're going to be able to get foreign exchange reserves is by adding value to our agricultural produce, packaging it well, and selling it to the West or, or any place else. That's how we're going to be able to get add value and get foreign exchange reserves, pay down our debt, and then use at the same time as we pay down that debt simultaneously build industry. And that's what we call a vertical uh, horizontal integration. Okay, so we go like this in not only paying a debt, but building industry. And as I mean, more money comes in, uh, we go into more sophisticated items in terms of building um, our, our local um, d uh, domestic market. I mean, my next question was going to be about how you're going to invest the 10 billion a year, you said in agriculture, but I guess through raising funds, how you just said, that would be how the money would be found. But you also talked about cutting embassies um, in Ghana to just five. Uh, what is the need for that? Well, uh, listen, the purpose of an embassy for every nation is to build what we call a trade desk. A trade desk is a commerce desk <clears throat> where the people in the secretariat communicate with the host country to find out ways that they can learn from this country in really creating an economic combustion in their country. In all the 55 embassies that we have, there are no trade desks. We're not getting any returns from them. So why, Bobby, why, why do we need to keep them? No, makes sense, makes sense. You with me? Listen, everything I talk about is common sense. Nothing sexy, just common sense. Common sense is what the governments of NDC and MPP do not have. It's not competence. It's not competence. You see, till you get over common sense, you cannot even get into the arena of competence. You see? So what we're talking about is common sense. Well, in regards to, again, um, the Ghanaians who live outside of the country, what plans have you got for them to get involved in sort of supporting your campaign? We, well, we in supporting the campaign, and that's why we're here in London. Um, uh, we're, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be in California. We were there last two months. Uh, we travel around the world uh, talking to Ghanaians all over uh, for them to know that it's to their benefit that they support me. Matter of fact, they don't even have a choice because they're all part of the endangered species community. Unless they support us and we clean out what's happening in Ghana, they're going to be an endangered species. So it's to your benefit that they support me because we see when they support me every year, Ghanaians bring home, Bobby, $6 billion plus, $6 billion to support their families okay, and themselves in Ghana. Now, when they support us to be the new leadership, 
that we will make systems work so they won't have to bring in that remittance money to support their families. Does that make sense? So you invest, even if it's $100 million, you invest it once in me so you wouldn't have to bring in $6 billion every year because the $6 billion every year will not stop. Matter of fact, it's going to get worse. Mm. I mean, we talk about African corruption and we hear a lot of leaders speak um, not as in detail and as passionate as you've spoken about, but we hear many uh, leaders speak before they come into power and make promises. And when they come into power, there's a lot of corruption. First and foremost, what are you going to do to co combat corruption that's happening in Ghana right now? And if you were to come in power, who would be the ministers you would be choosing? Is it people that you know already who, who may be friends? which can also, um, I guess, be a conflict of interest or would it be an interview process and who, has, who fits the right model? Bobby, the problem with corruption is very simple. The people who are elected are themselves criminals. That's why they can't eradicate corruption. That's just as simple as that. No leader, and I bet any leader to call me on my phone and argue that out, that, hey, listen, I'm not a criminal, but I just don't know how to eradicate criminal. Uh, uh, corruption, then you don't need to be there in the first place. Okay, so let me take you through corruption for a second. Number one, if I am corrupt, I have relinquished all moral rights to hold somebody else accountable for not being corrupt. Am, am, am I understood? Yeah. Okay, good. The second thing is how we fight in corruption. We're the only ones who are going to fight corruption on three levels. Bobby, we're going to fight it administratively, criminally, and psychologically. Administratively, we're going to create systems, okay? Systems, and I, I don't know if I have the time to go through, but we're going to make sure that the first level of systems is institutional infrastructure, meaning every agency is going to have everything they need to have to be able to perform adequately. So um, just because you don't have the right tools to perform, somebody does something wrong and it causes financial loss to the state, number one. Number two, we're going to have a mechanical system put in so that the system is not run based on personality. It's run based on a system. What is a system? A system is an institute. It's a mechanical system that you put into uh, uh, any human endeavor that has an expectation of performance. Okay? That has an end goal, and you guide that end goal. And what that does is it has three prong, the objective, the mechanical part of the system, and the discipline part. The discipline part is the accountability, making sure that everything is run on a system, not based on personality as in Ghana particularly is. Everything in Ghana is run by a person. So if Bobby is better than me, Bobby runs the system, he retires, I come in, I don't have a clue, the whole system crumbles. And that's why all our agencies have crumbled. If we run it on a cookie cutter system, then guess what? Whether you're good or bad, it's a cookie cutter, so it checks you and makes sure that the end goal is determined before you even get there. So it doesn't matter about your personality. We don't have systems in Ghana. And if, it's, if we have it, it's not giving us the results. So there's something seriously wrong. So we're going to have a system. And that is what we're going to take out paper money. Everything is going to be on a DLT, distributed ledger technology, which means it's going to be algorithmic. Processes are going to be algorithmically done so that um, Anytime you do a transaction, you're going to have a, a register present itself at all the different locations where the DLT is. So it's going to be almost impossible. Uh, I was in uh, Shanghai uh, a week and a half ago, and Bobby, I went into the uh, Urban uh, Development Center in Shanghai, and I saw how the DLT um, works. We did a video of it, and it, it will be on the website maybe tomorrow or next week. Um, and we we'll show the whole of Ghana how DLT works. But these are systems that have been used by the most sophisticated uh, government agencies around the world, and that's what we're bringing into uh, Ghana. And the third thing is, is we're going to punish corruption immediately. Guess what? 
the NDC, who is the opposition party, blames the MPP that they are corrupt. The MPP, who is the governing party, blames the opposition party, the NDC, that they are corrupt. But Bobby, when any of them come to power, nobody is caught, nobody is put in jail, nobody is prosecuted. So who is a thief? Mm. Who is a corrupt person? Everybody points fingers, but nobody gets caught. So what does that tell you? They are criminals. And with us, obviously, I'm not a criminal. And with us, if you cause financial loss to the state, guess what? Capital punishment. So, Bobby, it's, it's plain and simple. We, we're the only ones who, who have said uh, that we're going to strip the presidential exemptions. What the presidential exemptions are is if you are president and you, you, know, you steal money, uh, the law can't touch you. You get exemptions. We're going to strip that, those exemptions and change the Constitution so it doesn't protect criminals. The Constitution, as we have had it in Ghana, protects criminals. The 1992 Constitution, it protects criminals. And we're going to change it so that these criminals are not protected. They're not shielded. The moment you steal, guess what? You get to a fast track court and you prosecute it and we'll put you behind in jail. That's it. I understand. I hear that. It sounds like a, a, a solid plan. Uh, whatever happened to uh, Ghana Airlines is something that was uh, once a proud beacon of Africa. Guess what? Corruption took it out. Just okay. like corruption has taken out a telecommunication system, uh, a water corporation. Every agency in Ghana right now is broken down because of corruption. The same corruption that took out Ghana Airways. Uh, we, we have these uh, uh, presidents talk about um, uh, 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 they talk about um, uh, that they w we want to have uh, more people come to Ghana. Uh, every, they talk to the world about coming to Ghana to enjoy Ghana, but we don't even have an airline. Does that make sense to you, Bobby? It doesn't make sense to me. How, what vessel are they bringing to Ghana? If we're going to talk tourism, then we better have the things in place so that when people come, they will be able to exploit so that Ghana can make money. There's no point talking to the world about tourism when the tourism places don't even have lights. Lights go off at the tourism places. They don't even have roads. They don't have beds. They don't have any leisure amusement parks. They don't have water parks. They don't have anything. Oh, just come to Ghana. Figure out when you come to Ghana how to make yourself happy. That doesn't sound like a plan to me. So uh, what we're going to do, we're going to invest in agri-tourism. Uh, uh, in Singapore, man, there were so many places uh, that we went. Uh, tourism was everywhere. Singapore makes $16 billion from Singapore. There are f oh, less than 6 million people. We are 35 million. We have more than 200 places that we can develop for tourism. Guess what? The leaders don't have a clue how to develop them. How can we keep them? How can we say these guys are leaders? I mean, and, talking and about leadership, um, you seem to someone that, that's well-spoken. You mm -hmm. come across as a, a leader. What is your background in leadership? Um, have you got examples of places where you've led on big organizations where the people can say, you know what, he's got a trusted background where we can trust his leadership? I trained directly with uh, John Maxwell. John Maxwell is the godfather of leadership, and I'm proud to say that I trained under him. I'm a trained a trainer student. Um, so, and in Travelers, where I was a VP, vice president there, uh, leadership was the way to go. I mean, uh, and, and everything you do in life, uh, really, if, uh, Bobby, if you're not a leader, you're going to have problems. I've been a leader uh, for as long as I can remember in terms of all the positions that I played. I've been pretty much everywhere I have been. I've, been, uh, I've had a top position as a leader everywhere I've been in my professional life. Uh, so I understand what leadership is, and that's one thing I always point to that uh, the Ghanaian position holders do not understand. They just come in there to exploit the system, get paid, <clears throat> don't create any systems, and they go. And 
it's we have to stop the nonsense. Uh, the, 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 it just doesn't make sense. Uh, we have given a uh, chance to these clowns, and I call them clowns because it's a circus in Ghana because it's filthy, it's, dir uh, it's dirty, it's everything you don't want to see in Ghana, it is. And uh, we're sick and tired of it. We got to let it go. Um, the healthcare system in Ghana uh, faces various challenges, including in inadequate um, infrastructure and access to quality healthcare services. What model would you kind of change to actually um, structure it into a, a more um, measurable way that will be good for the people? Well, listen, it, you know, for the model that we bring in, we bring in a model that's human-centered. A, hum a human-centered model does not isolate in terms of the things that you focus on and the things you don't focus on. A human-centered model is a one system. So uh, it's said that a rising tide floats all boats. When you rise the tide, every boat on it floats and it rises, right? So it, it's a consciousness in leadership. So when we talk about healthcare, uh, we want healthcare for all. Right now, if you go to Ghana right now, you would see people, uh, stragglers around the long side of the road. Everywhere you go there, people who are deranged, who are uh, mad, who are uh, whatever situation they have, uh, they've been left to rot by the roadside. You cannot have a, a concerned, civilized society where some of the citizens of the same quilt that makes you are left to rot by the roadside. So our healthcare system is going to focus on children, the disabled, women, people who are not uh, able to take care of themselves uh, based on your income. Uh, but we're going to take care of every single one. Uh, we're not going to bring in all this fake pharmaceuticals uh, from all over the world that people are uh, pur uh, purveying uh, into Ghana. Uh, we, we are going to get into pharmaceuticals ourselves. Uh, we're going to create vaccines, we're going to have health care systems all over the country, in every region, in every major city, in every town. Uh, we're going to train our doctors. Uh, there are more Ghanaian doctors in the Bronx of New York than the whole of Ghana. That's, that's, that's an, a ridiculous aberration, you see, uh, because we don't take care of our health care. Uh, we give them away and we feel... Uh, we should be given an Oscar for that. The government actually announces that, hey, this year we're going to have 95% of our doctors uh, go to some other country and they're going to pay us 3,000 pounds for each one of them. It's almost like a slave trade. Uh, so that's not going to happen in Africa, in Ghana, for sure. We're going to take care of our doctors. We're going to take care of our nurses. We're going to give them their bonuses. We're going to give them their, uh, um, uh, the housing that they deserve and give them the perks that they deserve so they can also feel worthy and take care of our citizens the way they need to take care of our citizens. I mean, that also maybe touches onto education um, in regards to um, the need to revamp the education system, but also what more can you do for those in uh, rural villages who may not have access to the same quality of education that others do? Well, the, the problem is, the, the reason why people in the villages don't have the same access is because um, <clears throat> everything is centered in the cities. So uh, you want, we want to decentralize. We're definitely going to decentralize how education and all the social services work so it goes everywhere people are. But more importantly, when it comes to education, we're going to be involved in relevant education. The education system right now is not relevant. We don't take care of what our needs are and train people based on our needs. What we're doing is, is we have one system cookie cutter where <clears throat> everybody goes through a grind, goes through a system, and once they matriculate, they, we throw them into a big bin and say, go fend for yourself. That's not how a civilized, organized society works. So we're going to take care of the areas that we need people to go and incent institutions that train in those disciplines and help them. Once these students matriculate, we're going to take them and then we're going to put them into entrepreneurial development centers, train them so that they could be fully fledged. They could help themselves 
and then help them with not just let them go, but also help them with the tools so that when we leave them to go at whatever level they have gotten to in education, they're able to help themselves so that they could add to the grid when it comes to paying taxes. Because not only can they work and make a living, can they pay taxes? And then we can use the money for that's being put into the grid to develop further to help those who are underprivileged. I mean, touching on that again as well, so you'll get to a point that where you're educating these young people into um, a place um, and skills, upskill them to the point of getting the education they need to uh, work in the sectors they need. But we're also in an era of rapid technology enhancements in regards to things like AI, artificial intelligence, which is going to be taking jobs across the board, especially in the Western world. Obviously, Africa's a little bit behind, but as that develops, how do you safeguard these new trained um, young people into sort of still having jobs because robots and artificial intelligence is doing the jobs that these people can do? Well, of course, because we, we realize that, and that's why we big in artificial intelligence and virtual reality, and that's why we actually ahead of the game and going into DLT, which is distributed ledger technology and uh, augmented reality. That's what we're talking about. We, uh, we left artificial intelligence in the dust. We had augmented reality now. So what that, this is why I took the trip to uh, Beijing and Shanghai and uh, uh, you know, Wanzhou to see how these things work at Alibaba. I went to Alibaba, I saw how these things work uh, uh, first hand and this is how we're going to put into education system now I know it sounds like a lot of money but with uh, institutions that have gone to some level in terms of uh, uh, academics once they cut the the, the, the uh, get to that level we are gonna the government is going to help them with these institutions these uh, infrastructure where we're gonna uh, expose them to this high level, uh, technologies of AI and uh, VR and uh, DLT so that uh, people could train at that level and at that level once they get graduated they could go into uh, institutions and companies that when they use the uh, these technologies they, it would not seem like there is a vacuum there is a gap that's why we also are not focusing on STEM science technology <coughs> engineering, mathematics, we're focusing on STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, so that there is a full roundedness with the development of our students before they go into the world. I mean, yeah, I was going to mention um, also about the arts and the creative field, there because that plays a big part Absolutely. Um, in, in society, but it seems to be looked over, especially in Africa. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's uh, I just told you. We, that's why we're not focusing on st STEM. We're focusing on STEAM, because the arts, entertainment, uh, sports, um, you know, we are going to, I don't know if uh, we, they still have the Michael Sobel so Sports Stadium, in Tottenham, uh, in in Holloway, okay, yeah, yeah. in Holloway, it used yeah. to be in Holloway. Yeah, it's still there. I, I, it's still there. So that's how I grew up. So I've had that concept in my head from when I grew up. I always ask myself why uh, we have to play soccer in on dirt fields in in Ghana. So the concept has been taken to a whole different level. So in communities now, what we're going to do is we're going to build sports centers where we're going to have uh, people who are certify trainers who train in different uh, sports, uh, uh, you know, soccer, badminton, table tennis, uh, different things to train these kids swimming so that at the global level they can also compete. Uh, you know, you don't have to, uh, all you have to do is just show uh, minimal talent for you to be uh, recruited into these, uh, 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 you know, teams for you to be um, exposed to uh, a specialized trainer to teach you and get you your talent, uh, your skill set to a whole different level to play at a global level. We are going to be doing that for our children, our communities. The good thing is we're going to have a 15-minute uh, environmental urban uh, 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 discipline where all these things are going to be 15 minutes from where people live. If you have to walk to these places, you wouldn't have to get on a train or a bus, or even if you did, 
15 minutes you're there at the sports center. We're going to build it in communities. And that's why we've talked about functional urban communities. Functional urban communities are communities where everything is in your community. You don't have to move out of your community to get any part of your lifestyle. You see, you, we're going to build communities like we did in Ghana. They build the Saglame housing. Uh, it doesn't make any kind of sense. It's a waste of brick and mortar. Okay, the Saglame housing should have been a community housing project where they had uh, a sports centers, uh, they have uh, faith, uh, uh, you know, faith centers, they have entertainment centers, they have studios, they have different art classes. Uh, all these things are supposed to be in a community so that one does not have to travel far to get to these places. And that's how we're going to build the new communities of Ghana. In terms of yourself and the work you've done in Ghana, have you got any um, experience of any philanthropist work you've put out there and the, the charities that you've worked with out there already? Uh, we have some. Uh, we don't want it to be a bragging point. Uh, what we're always saying is, is uh, the world and the technology right now and uh, we have at hand, uh, we just need people who are, like I said, human-centered. If you science-based, data-driven, human-centered, Everything you need is at your fingertips. The, 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 the variable that will separate us from everybody else is if you have the means to get it. And Bobby, uh, with just one person airlifting uh, uh, half a billion dollars a year of gold from Ghana, one person, okay, uh, that tells you we have the means. There are about maybe 100, 150 people who are dealing gold in Ghana. We haven't talked about cocoa, we haven't talked about oil, we haven't talked about limestone and all the other uh, tens of minerals that we have in Ghana. So what we're saying is this, it's the person who has a, a human-centered mind and consciousness for the people who will change Ghana. You don't have to have any prior anything else. If you think and you have the visionary mind to get things done, just like uh, Sheikh Mohammed uh, bin uh, Rashid from uh, Dubai did with Dubai, uh, just like uh, the leaders of, uh, 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 you know, Shanghai uh, did. Uh, if you go to parts uh, called Pudong uh, in, in, in Shanghai, uh, for 35 years it was a farmland. Now they've built it for 25 million people off the cuff like that. How did that happen? Well, they didn't sit in the classroom and learn about this. They decided one day that, hey, listen, we had to do this for our people, and they did it. That's the kind of leadership we need in Africa, particularly in Ghana. And that's what we are bringing. And that's why we are different from the other two. I mean, I recognize that as well, because when I went to uh, Dubai myself, I just saw that 30 years ago, 35 years ago, this was desert land. And now look at this thriving place. And we, and in Africa, what is it stopping for the governments to actually do these things? So maybe, uh, uh, Bobby, I should be interviewing you at this point because you've seen what a lot of people in Africa think is magic. You see? Uh, if I don't know if you went to Palm Jumeirah in Dubai when you went, uh, but what... You know, when I, I saw in Dubai, I thought, oh, my gosh, look at Dubai. Then I went to Singapore, and I was like, oh, my gosh. Then I went to Shanghai, and I was like, oh, my gosh. Shanghai has put all of that on steroids. Wow. It, it's, it makes Dubai look like, eh, well, you guys are good, but... Come play with the big boys. I mean, I actually made a post about that today, actually. I was saying that um, it seems as if, especially um, East Asia, is, is as if they're living in the future already. No, no, it's, it's sick. Listen, uh, you go to Dubai DX, uh, DBX airport. Dubai airport is nice. But go to Shanghai in Singapore. Have you been there? No. Oh, my gosh. It's an airport in a forest. And they have a place called the Jewel. And you get there and you like, you get goosebumps because it's like, you don't even understand. You think you're dead in heaven. 
It's ridiculous. And then you go to Hamad in, um, uh, in Qatar, and you're like, wow. And then you come to Beijing. Oh my God. It's like, uh, uh, what's this? A fly fish? Uh, well, no, no. What's the uh, fish what's, water what's, what's the fish that stung uh, crocodile Dundee? What's that? Stingray. Stingray. It's like a stingray. It's a multiple stingray. It's sick. I'm not like, is this an airport? You go for like five miles and you're still in the airport. Wow. And you take the train and you like from Charing Cross to Waterloo and you would think, and you're still in the airport. It's, it's ridiculous. So what we have seen in Dubai, the East, the Far East have put on steroids and Africa is still sitting. What are we waiting for? And you tell me these leaders are talking about, well, the West is going to do the nonsense. Come on, get out of here with that nonsense. We're sick and tired of that. It's time to go. Go. We don't even want them to reinvent themselves. We just want them to get off and leave us for us to build something big because the world that we want to bring to Africa is a different world because you see we have what it takes we have the land we have the people do you know that Africa has the youngest generation uh, uh, right now Bobby 66 mm percent -hmm. of Africa's youth Africa's population is the youth nobody else has it like that you know, Far East, they are begging right now China for people to have more children, and people are refusing to have children. Everywhere, people, they're begging. So what's going to happen is China is going to build it big, but then foreigners, the Indians are coming in, people from all over Philippines, they're coming into China, and regardless of how tough your laws are, at some point you have to let loose your laws because who's going to do the work, mm. right? The same thing with Dubai. Only the, uh, the you know, uh, the, 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 the Emiratis in, in Dubai, they don't do any work. 85% of the people in Dubai are all foreigners working for the lifestyle of the people from Dubai. How long is that going to last? And then every three years, they recycle the people. What is Ghana going to do? What is Africa doing? The world is coming to our feet, and you have these clowns talking about, oh, uh, the West is going to do this if you do it. Come on, man. What we need is common sense. We need common sense to build it big. And for us to be competitive for the next new order, we need a new class of generational thinkers who think not out of the box, who think in a different space, who think in a different realm. And that's what I am talking about. And that's why we need to change these leaders, especially the leaders of NDC and MPP. They're not ready to play ball. The ball that they played is of the past. We are of a new generation. We've seen the future. We have touched the future. We have felt the future. We smelled the future. We tasted the future. These guys, And uh, sort of last few questions here in regards to I guess the gender inequality remains a concern in Ghana, particularly uh, regarding women's representation in politics and the workforce. What sort of policies and initiatives are you going to help in regards to bring up the um, in the inequalities that women still face? It's very simple. For everything we're going to do, we're going to encourage and empower and develop minorities to be part. So people who are uh, may be uh, challenged people, women, we're going to encourage them, we're going to develop them because most of, because of our culture, most of the women have been played in the back roles. We're going to bring them to the forefront of everything we're going to do and empower them and help them have institutions that are going to focus on human de uh, women development uh, because, uh, you know, to have a woman actually in politics is uh, women are community-based thinkers, men are not, you see? So uh, it, it's, it's safer for any civilization to immerse women in their cultures and in their development than to have um, uh, men only. 
and uh, we're going to change that. We have, we have a secretariat that's going to focus on women, that's going to help women. We're going to give women loans. We're going to be more pro-women in terms of developing them for business, entrepreneurial skills, sports, everything. We're going to have women at the forefront. And uh, we touched on China earlier on, and you mentioned a lot of technology that you've seen, obviously, also out in the, in the East. Are China still in, in, in a place where we still need them in Africa to do the development and building of our roads and infrastructure, or is that something that can now be taken over by Africans and we can do these things ourselves? Listen, we want to develop fast, so we're going to have China come in to do it, but the way we're going to negotiate this is you just don't develop and leave it so when it's time to maintain, we're going to call you to come back and do it. We want you to do the development and in the process train our people so they could take over from wherever you leave off. You see? Because we don't have time to train our people. We don't have the time. We're going to be f too far behind. So we need to bring the people who have mastered the skill to come in and work with our people to get the job done. And th that's what Egypt has done in TIDA, Taijian Economic Development uh, Area. They've, Egypt paid them f China $5 billion, and in a three-square-mile area, they have built a new village of technology, hotels, a whole hub. You see, that's what we're going to do. In Ghana, there are 16 regions. If we paid China to come in and develop these 16 regions, it would be 16 times 8. How much is that? Not much of a money because uh, the current party right now spent, um, they spent 77, they have spent $77.5 billion and there's nothing to show for it. $77.5 billion. You see? So if you bring um, China to come build that which they have done in Egypt, in Ghana, it would be fifteen five billion dollars per region. We are planning on scaling the 16 regions to 10 regions, so that would be 50 billion. But at least we know that in five years we will have s 10 new cities in um, uh, uh, Ghana. The Burj Khalifa in um, Dubai was, is $1.5 billion. Well, if you blow $77.5 billion, that means you can build more than 16 Burj Khalifas in Ghana in a period of five years. But they blew it. Does that make sense to you? So what I'm saying is we have the money. This is not even adding value to everything else that we are exporting. We don't add value to it. We still had more money to do it, and we haven't done it. So... Um, it, it would, the, 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 the key thing is negotiating with whoever is doing the initial work so that as they do it, they train your people. And plus, what you need to also understand, Bobby, is, is Ghanaians, and uh, there are a lot of Ghanaians and a lot of Africans who are in the diaspora who have the skill set. But because conditions are really bad in Africa, nobody wants to come. So all you have to do is give them some assurances so that they could come to Africa and get this job done. And that's what we're going to do. We're not going to make uh, transitioning to Ghana, uh, uh, you know, uh, finding needle in a haystack. Uh, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to hold your hand and work, you through, work through it with you so that it's a seamless transition. That's what we're going to do. So uh, th these are some of the things we're going to do to make sure that the diaspora, who is a trained middle class, comes to Ghana uh, and, and have a good time and, and start their businesses because most of them are entrepreneurs just like yourself. Can you imagine you starting a, 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 a football club in Ghana or somewhere else in, in Africa and getting the sponsorships that you're getting? And uh, that would be a beautiful thing. Imagine all the training you could give to a youth, but you were here in London, okay? But if we made conditions better for you in Africa, I'm sure you'd consider it. So these are some of the things we're going to do to cause our trained and skilled diaspora to come back home to help us with the development. Okay, so let's imagine it's now, um, it's elections next year, right? Next year, December. So let's say it's now December 2022. 
2024 and they say the next president of Ghana is Mr. Kofi. What is your feeling? Um, it's not going to be any because I feel that already that that's this is what the call is going to be. I'm just waiting to go up the podium and uh, read my speech, uh, the acceptance on how Ghana has changed from tonight. And everybody in the world is going to know that this is a new Ghana from the speech. Yeah. And any last words for uh, especially for our audience here in the UK, the Ghanaian community? Well, listen, this is what I would say. We, we are at the point right now where, to tell the truth, uh, you know, for those of you watching us, we don't have a choice in where we are. If the world, this is the new world order, whether we like it or not, the world is our, as a doorstep. They're going to roll over us if we don't do something. If we go with the old order of the NDC and MPP, the, the world is going to take us over. They're already in Ghana. They're already in Africa. So we need to do something big, something of a quantum leap into the stratosphere thinking. And I believe if you're listening to us today, without a doubt, you will know that Kofi Karanting is the man for 2024. But you need to help us. We need money, not money to spend on frivolous things, but money to build this campaign and to bring this campaign to the rural areas so that they will know who Kofi Karanting is and what we stand for. We need you to reach out into your pockets and get on our website, www.kofikaranting.com. Kofikaranting.com and go to donate and donate money. We need you, if you're in Ghana or anywhere else and you want to help us with our Momo, our Momo account is 059-999-5120. 059-999-5120. Get involved. This could be the last chance before we fall off the cliff. And when we do, the World Bank actually, when I was on the plane going to uh, Singapore, yes, I saw a publication from the World Bank saying that Ghana owes $98 billion. $98 billion. We don't have a system to repay $98 billion with the current leadership or the opposition leadership. They have been failures, and they know they're failures. They're taking Ghanaians for fools. So for, if for those of you who support them, I will strongly suggest to you, I will ask you to stop supporting them and support us instead because they don't have any plans for Ghana except for run us down, which they have done very well in the last 32, almost 32 years. Join us. Push a message. Put us on your social media platforms like Bobby has, is going to do. And let us win and win back Ghana and build Ghana for all of us to be proud of Ghana. Because if we don't, we're going to lose Ghana and we're never going to get it back again. Thank you very much. And that there was another big eagle interview.